I have the teachers who are there prepping the students poll the students and say, what would you like to be? And this is students from 6th through 12th grade. When a student goes, well, I am devoutly Jewish and I've got family members in Israel. I would like to be a member of the Likud party. Guess what we make that student? <laughs> a member of Hamas. educational civil disobedience, where students are learning about the Middle East and they're putting pressure on our government to create a Palestinian state. This is Weston High School located in the town of Weston, Massachusetts, an affluent suburb of Boston. Axis of Hope, a nonprofit organization that offers workshops in schools around the country, conducted a workshop on the Arab-Israeli conflict at Weston High School in May 2013. It was called Who's Jerusalem? And it was part of the school's Global Education Initiative. Axis of Hope was founded in 2002 by Carl Hobart, a language teacher at the All Boys Belmont Hill Prep School. It has an idealistic mission. Dedicated to developing in adolescence an understanding of alternative nonviolent approaches to resolving complex conflicts locally, nationally, and internationally. In 2008, Hobart joined Boston University as a clinical instructor, and in 2012, Boston University officially hosted Axis of Hope at its School of Education. We have to support uh, those peacemakers like Carl Holbert who are going to spend the time to really help teachers get better at what they do and kids acquire the skills they need to be successful in the 21st century. Axis of Hope is a nonprofit organization teaching youth in their formative years of life what I call preventive diplomacy how to work together as a team to prevent conflict. This is what you present to kids. Different sides, different options, different ways to look at the world. Are they gonna prevent conflict? Are they gonna get out there and try and make a lot of money and exacerbate conflict? Yet Hobart's noble declarations about peace actually mask a political, non-academic agenda. Interviewed by Qatar-owned Al Jazeera TV, Carl Hobart openly described the political goals of Axis of Hope's Arab-Israeli conflict workshop. Educational civil disobedience, where students are learning about the Middle East and they're putting pressure on our government to create a Palestinian state. The students' workshop assignments reflect an activist political agenda to influence U.S. foreign policy. What they have to do by the end is come up with a letter of recommendation on how to bring more effective peace to the Middle East. We mail it to George Mitchell, our special envoy to the Middle East, Hillary Rodham Clinton, and Barack Obama. For almost a century, some of the world's best experts and diplomats have tried and failed to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. Instead of teaching students how to understand the complex hundred-year-old conflict between Arabs and Jews, Axis of Hope is encouraging teenagers to come up with political solutions based on misleading teaching materials. You have exactly 20 minutes to focus on Jerusalem and come up with three things that you agree on. One, the security of Jerusalem. Two, the health care system in Jerusalem. Three, education. So you would have two separate schools. Palestinian so school and So what can you offer them instead? Then? I told you, a hospital in the same region. That's a Jew hospital, maybe like five miles down the street. It doesn't matter 
what religion you are. If you're hurt, you want help. We are the Arab League, and we are committed for the justice of Palestinians and their people. We want justice for Palestine and punishment for Israel for what they've done. This is Israel's responsibility. I also want the Israeli army to be removed immediately from the new state and the capital of Palestine. I am just amazed at the time and effort that Professor Hobart spent just so kids like me and my friends can learn diplomatic skills. Because of Professor Hobart, I am sure that many a life is saved in the future. A seventh grade student at Horner Junior High School in Fremont, California. Carl Hobart paints grandiose scenarios as a way to motivate and recruit students to his brand of political activism. These scenarios ignore the complex and messy real world. If there will still be conflict, of course, but people will know how to go about ending it quicker or more responsibly. My goal before dying would be for one of you to invite me to come to Oslo, and I'll see you be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And that Nobel Peace Prize will come as a result of what you're working toward in terms of peace in the Middle East and creation of a Palestinian state. Hopefully it will happen well before then. That's my goal in my life. Hobart seeks to convince students that there is a logical and perhaps even easily reached diplomatic solution to the conflict. Hobart does this by falsely claiming that Fatah and Hamas are comparable to the major political parties in democratic Israel. Who is Fatah? What is Hamas? What's the difference between Likud and Labor? It's all clarified for students. They learn that Hamas and Fatah are two thriving Palestinian political parties that have chosen to support change in the Gaza Strip and parts of the West Bank by more peaceful means than Intifada. Hobart omits or excuses away the terrorist methods of Fatah. Hobart downplays Hamas terror against Israeli civilians and its call for the murder of all Jews. Also, Hamas's brutal way it deals with its own citizens is mostly minimized in Hobart's teaching materials. Hobart seems to excuse terrorism by suggesting a moral equivalence between suicide bombings, which deliberately target innocent civilians, with the military use of drones, the purpose of which is to stop terrorism and minimize civilian casualties. You know what those planes are? They have no pilots on. You know what they do? Very effectively now for the United States, they're going to kill people who are supposedly terrorists. Isn't that a form of U.S. terrorism? Isn't that a form of suicide bombing? Though we don't really commit suicide, we have something very technological. Hobart's educational approach targets Jewish students. They are encouraged to empathize with Hobart's manufactured version of Hamas, an organization whose founding charter calls for the complete destruction of Israel and the Jewish people. The day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight Jews and kill them. It's especially interesting when you ask students what they'd like to be prior to the negotiations, you make them exactly the opposite of what they'd like to be. In this way, they're learning how to walk in the shoes of others and become or develop more empathy. I have the teachers who are there prepping the students pull the student and say, what would you like to be? And this is students from 6th through 12th grade. When a student goes, well, I am devoutly Jewish and I've got family members in Israel. I would like to be a member of the Likud party. Guess what we make that student? 
a member of Hamas. Hobart seems proud when he succeeds in turning Jewish students away from their natural support of Israel. In his book, Raising Global IQ, Hobart writes about a Jewish girl playing the role of Hamas. On this exciting day of formal negotiations, one normally introverted ninth grade Jewish student speaks out passionately against the oppression of her people, playing the role of a Hamas party member incredibly well. The same girl two years before had her bat mitzvah in Jerusalem. While promoting the feel-good goal of peace between Israelis and Palestinians based on the establishment of a Palestinian state, Hobart mostly discounts the ongoing desire by many in the region to destroy the Jewish state. <laughs> By focusing narrowly on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Hobart mostly ignores the wider turmoil and violence in the region, which has increased significantly in recent years with the civil wars in Syria and Iraq and the rise of the Islamic State. Hobart appears to construct a false equivalence between Israel and the Palestinians as a way of facilitating his simplistic solutions for peace. In a glossary handout to students taking part in the Who's Jerusalem workshop, Jerusalem is identified as a city of historical and religious significance to both Palestinians and Israelis, and the capital of Israel. Hobart omits key historical facts in an attempt to show that Jews and Palestinians have equal claims to the city. He doesn't explain that Jerusalem has been the holiest site in the world to Jews for almost 3,000 years and is also sacred to Christians as the place where Jesus died. Jerusalem is cited over 500 times in the Jewish Bible and not mentioned at all in the Quran. Hobart ignores the historical fact that Jerusalem was conquered and colonized by imperialist Arab armies in 637 CE. To demonstrate Muslim supremacy, they built mosques on top of the site of the Jewish holy temples. Ottoman Muslims did the same in 1453 after conquering the Christian Byzantine capital Constantinople, which today is called Istanbul. While Muslims consider Jerusalem to be the third holiest city in Islam, only in 1988 did Palestinian leaders claim Jerusalem as the capital of a future Palestinian state after King Hussein of Jordan abandoned any claims to the city. The glossary handout identifies Israel as the world's only primarily Jewish state, and since its creation, it has been in constant struggle with neighboring Arab countries. By using the phrase, constant struggle, the workshop's materials gloss over Arab aggressions and wars against Israel. According to the glossary, the Arab League is a regional organization of Arab states in the Middle East and North Africa formed in 1945 to mediate disputes and strengthen economic, political, and cultural aims of member countries. What is mostly ignored in this definition is the fact that the Arab League's first major action upon its formation was to coordinate a declared genocidal war against Israel. The day after Israel declared its independence, all seven members of the Arab League launched a genocidal war of aggression on the newly founded state. And when that failed, it promoted a boycott of the Jewish state. Hobart mostly ignores the historical record and engages in unfounded speculation about the 1967 war for example, 1967, Six-Day War. Huh. Who was right? Israel to expand because it feared people were going to come in, like the height of the Holocaust? Or was it a preemptive strike to take over the Golan Heights, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip? The Arab War against Israel continued after its independence. 
In early June 1967, tensions in the Middle East were rising. Egyptian President Abdel Nasser was calling on all Arab nations to destroy Israel and drive the Jews into the sea. Arab armies began gathering on Israel's borders to simultaneously invade from Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Israel preempted them and won the war against the combined forces of the three Arab armies in just six days. The war resulted in Israel's taking over of the West Bank in Gaza, occupied until then by the Jordanian and Egyptian armies. Hobart presents the Arab-Israeli conflict as mostly a land dispute and a clash of two national movements. He minimizes the religious factor of Islamic supremacy involved in the rejection of a Jewish sovereignty in the Middle East. Palestine is an Islamic land. The day the enemies usurp part of Muslim land, jihad becomes the individual duty of every Muslim. The glossary identifies Palestine as the name used to describe the area of land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea during the British occupation prior to 1948. Although the region is presently referred to as Israel, Palestinians seek to re-establish their home state under this name. In a statement of political propaganda disguised as educational fact, the phrase to re-establish their home state contains an outright lie. Since there never was a Palestinian state, such a state cannot by definition be re-established. The name Palestine was first used by the Romans for the ancient land of Judea conquered and colonized by the Roman Empire. Its use was a deliberate effort by the Romans to erase the Jewish connection to the land, just as the Palestinian leadership has been attempting to do since 1948. The boundaries of Palestine have varied throughout history. For the 500 years of Ottoman Turkish rule, Palestine was mostly a province of Syria. After World War I and the British conquest, Palestine borders were initially defined to include Transjordan and, in 1923, narrowed to the lands between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Some of Hobart's definitions are embarrassingly wrong. According to Hobart's glossary, Diaspora is the name for Jewish communities located in newly formed Israel. Diaspora refers to Jewish communities living outside of Israel. Such linguistic sloppiness is hard to reconcile given the high academic standards at Boston University, which hosts Axis of Hope. Axis of Hope workshops emphasize transforming knowledge into political action instead of providing students with scholarly education. The workshops are used to enlist students as political activists for an ideological cause. The apparent bias in the Axis of Hope teaching materials is understandable, given Hobart's academic advisors. Professor Chomsky's advice and guidance have helped us at Axis of Hope to carefully craft in-class intellectual outward-bound conflict resolution exercises. To Professor Chomsky, I am greatly indebted as I use many of his sage ideas in teaching. Noam Chomsky is a professor of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, but he is more well known for his malicious writings against Israel, Judaism, America, and free enterprise. He has openly expressed support for Hamas. However, uh, we should recognize that the policies of Hamas are more forthcoming. Uh, and more conducive to a peaceful settlement than those of the United States or Israel. Israel, Taiwan, a couple of others. There's a kind of like a network, an international terror network. For decades, Israel has been kidnapping, killing, 
uh, civilians, Lebanese and Palestinians, in Lebanon on the high seas, uh, hijacking boats, either killing the people or uh, that's piracy, you know, much worse than anything Somalis do. Another Axis of Hope advisor is Northeastern University professor Dennis Sullivan, well known for his anti-Israel teachings and for whitewashing Hamas's genocidal intentions. Professor Sullivan's background casts some doubt on his impartiality as a scholar of Middle East history. He is a former advisor to the Palestinian Authority. He has also been the head of the American branch of the Palestinian American Research Center, an anti-Israel think tank. Hamas doesn't recognize Israel. So what? So we can say this, and Hamas is a terrorist organization, sure. They also do great health care and kindergartens. Actually, Hamas kindergartens instill young children with vicious hatred. <laughs> Axis of Hope undermines its idealistic mission statement by sacrificing unbiased understanding of the Arab-Israeli conflict for the sake of a political agenda. Axis of Hope promotes a simplistic a naive approach toward resolving complex international conflicts, exploits idealistic students to promote a political agenda, teaches a biased history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, uses teaching materials that are often academically shoddy and dishonest, It's not clear who was responsible for introducing Axis of Hope into Weston High School. The principal of Weston High School is Anthony A. Parker. Before pursuing a career in education, he was a journalist for various publications, including The Guardian and Sojourns. In an interview after being appointed principal, he stated, We want smart children who know the difference between right and wrong, who can make a moral decision. Weston High School parents should insist that Principal Parker live up to his stated goal for the students of the town of Weston. The superintendent of Weston Schools, when Axis of Hope began teaching workshops in Weston, was Cheryl R. Maloney, who also must be held accountable. Was Miss Maloney, who has a degree in history, aware of how history is taught in Weston High Schools? The Weston School Committee must investigate this effort of indoctrination. Weston is not unique. In the name of advancing global understanding, Axis of Hope workshops have been conducted in many schools. The National Association of Independent Schools includes Access of Hope workshops as part of its Global Curriculum Resources for Educators. Also included in the resources list is the much discredited Arab World Studies Notebook, which was developed with financial support from Saudi Arabia. Recently, whose Jerusalem workshops were included in the Massachusetts Department of Education curriculum standards, which were developed under a grant from the U.S. Department of Education. In 2014, Carl Hobart was promoted to faculty director of the Global Literacy Institute at Boston University School of Education, where he conducts the Axis of Hope workshops. The Massachusetts Council for Social Studies is also promoting Hobart's workshops. 
targeting social studies educators who receive professional development credits for participating. Boston University needs to be held accountable for promoting unscholarly and biased teaching as part of its well-intentioned efforts to develop global citizenship and more compassionate students. Axis of Hope is one of many initiatives that seek to promote anti-Israel or anti-Jewish propaganda in the classroom as part of teaching global understanding, critical thinking skills, and dialogue for peace. <laughs>